Sangeet Chowdhury has joined us today. He's an advisor to uh, Fortune 500 companies, to organizations like the World Economic Forum. Uh, Sangeet is the co-chair of the MIT Platform Strategy Summit at the MIT Media Labs. Uh, Sangeet has written for Harvard Business Review. They have recognized his thoughts and ideas as one of the top 10 innovative uh, ideas of this year. Um, Sangeet's also written two books. Many of us are familiar with those, uh, Platform Revolution and Platform Scale. They've influenced what we're doing at Glue, given us language and handles in really helpful ways. And uh, Sangeet's content comes largely from that material. He'll be talking even beyond that. More than any of those accomplishments and recognitions, though, uh, Sangeet has really felt like a friend of the program. He's leaned in with us and begun journeying with us, helped to advise us. He feels like a friend of the program, and he feels like an insider, and we've really appreciated that. He's consistently exceeded our expectations with his energy and his time and the level of detail that he goes into to serve glue and in serving us to serve you guys. So we are excited to have you guys uh, learn from him today, and so I'd just like to welcome our friend, Sangeet Chaudhry. A platform business model is about interactions enabled by infrastructure. And when we talk about deconstruction, if we're building a platform, the first starting point is for us to start by looking at the interaction and looking at what is the most basic level of value exchange that is happening between the producer and the consumer. How can I make that successful? And then how can I build an infrastructure that scales the success of that unit interaction? That fundamentally and essentially is what the platform business model is all about. If you look at this uh, idea of interactions and infrastructure, it, it, it throws a nice uh, um, combination because essentially a platform fundamentally powers two things. It powers access and it powers amplification. When access is provided, interactions ensue. When a good infrastructure is created, it amplifies the abilities of the participants to create and exchange value. And so fundamentally, the two key ways in which platforms create value is by opening up access within the ecosystem, by, by opening up the information to which people take decisions, by removing barriers for people to connect with each other, and by creating an infrastructure that amplifies the individual ability of every participant in the ecosystem. So with, with that um, introduction in mind, let's uh, move on to a few key ideas around what it means to run platform business models. Every platform has a fundamental design tension. And, and the tension is this, that platforms need to simultaneously scale quantity and quality. The challenge there, of course, is that quantity and quality sort of have a hyperbolic relationship. The, the, when you start scaling quantity, quality starts going down. When you start scaling quality, quantity uh, starts going down because you start putting in more friction. So the way platforms do this is, from a quantity perspective, try to figure out how to create, how to remove friction, how to uh, provide access, how to ensure that users can easily come in, participate, and perform uh, the required actions on the platform. They do this through managing open participation, figuring out where to open up the infrastructure for external producers and consumers to come in. And at that point, they need to start balancing it with the fact that when open participation starts off, you start having two kinds of issues. One, as we discussed, the quality starts going down. But the second is that the search efforts and costs involved start going up. The more choice I have, the more uh, overhead, the more search overhead I need to deal with. And so choice is not really the value over here. The value is relevance. What, what I care about as a consumer on the platform is not access to a thousand different products, but access to the one most relevant product. As a result, platforms need to constantly in their architecture balance open participation with curation and filtering. Curation is the idea of managing quality all through at every point in the platform, and filtering is the idea of ensuring that the most relevant things get served to the most relevant people. So when we look at what we've talked about so far, the idea of the interaction, the idea of openness, the idea of curation, the idea of relevance, all of these are the fundamental elements, the fundamental building blocks of the most deconstructed level of platform value creation. Let's talk about what synthesizes this deconstructed 
layer of value creation. So there are several things that work together to scale the platform. One is, as I mentioned, the idea of openness itself. When, when we talk about openness, there's, uh, there's uh, a corollary to that as well in the sense that openness is not about opening up everything and allowing all kinds of interactions to ensue from there, but it's about strategically deciding what are the points of control when you start opening up the system. Because business continues to be about managing the points of control and then charging for those points of control. So when we look at openness, what we need to think about is what are the points at which we need to start opening the system so that users can come and participate effectively and freely on the platform, but at the same time, what are the critical points of control that we need to put in the system? As an example of that, uh, when Android first came out in the market, Android was an extremely open system. It, 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 it came up with the whole open um, source philosophy and it was an extremely open system which allowed users to start, uh, users, uh, which allowed uh, producers on Android like Samsung, Amazon, all these companies to start forking Android and taking Android in new directions. And Google realized relatively early that if companies started fork forking Android, Google would lose control of the ecosystem. So they, they took a critical decision at that point where they removed the user relationship and critical services like mapping away from Android and put it into Google Play. And then they put the remaining infrastructure, the operating system of Android, and provided that as open source. So by closing Google Play, closing the user relationship, closing the data that the user provides, closing uh, uh, access to critical uh, applications like Maps, they prevented other companies from forking Android in that direction. So that was an example where Google take, took a decision that allowed them to be open and scale, but at the same time ensure that they had control over, the, over what was happening in the ecosystem because they controlled the critical assets in the ecosystem. The second thing that scales platforms it's the idea of network effects. We talked about this idea briefly today, and the simplest way of thinking about network effects is to start by thinking about the telephone. The telephone in itself has no utility, but as more people use the telephone, the utility of the telephone increases. And as more, of more people I know use the telephone, the utility of my telephone to me increases. Now, when we think about the internet, network effects start getting amplified because it's not just about how many people you can connect to, the internet also has two additional layers of value. First of all, the internet captures data. And because any system built on the internet can capture data, and that data can help the system learn more about you and help you benefit more from connectivity. Because as we meant, discussed, uh, as we uh, explored in the beginning, it's not about access and connectivity alone, it's about relevance. So what the internet powers is any system created on top of the internet, any platform can benefit from relevance because of the data that keeps getting accumulated. It can also benefit from better orchestration because, of, because the platform itself learns from all of this data. But secondly, the internet also allows the creation of persistent value. When I pick up a phone, I have a conversation with somebody, I put down the phone, we got value from each other, but nobody else gets value from that interaction. But when I go on YouTube and upload a video and share it with a few friends, they get value from it, but then everybody else on YouTube can potentially also get value from it. So it's the creation of persistent value that scales the network effect even faster than just the connectivity between different participants. So that's the second, that's the second and, and the single most important reason platforms scale rapidly once you've figured out the initial interaction. A third reason that leads to these network effects is the idea of the feedback loop, which is that every time I take an action, there's somebody else who benefits from that action and the platform communicates feedback from that person back to me, and that encourages me to come back and perform over here repeatedly. When you scale this feedback across a system, it leads to a self-reinforcing cycle that keeps scaling different activities within the workings of the platform. At an individual level, platforms also benefit from behavior design. A lot of platforms create entirely new behaviors for the first time. If you look at uh, the idea of uh, browsing feeds, we, uh, 10 years back we would never have browsed feeds, and today we browse feeds 20 times a day. Whether it's a feed on Instagram, or on Facebook, or Snapchat, we're constantly looking at feeds. And that is a new behavior that was created because the platform captured data and kept on reinforcing this feedback, and, and uh, kept on reinforcing this behavior because of this feedback. Another 
key in, uh, issue that, you, that platforms need to deal with as they scale is the idea of governance, which is that they need to ensure that they have, they, they partition the rights across different participants on, in the platform in the right way. They ensure that uh, every single participant on the platform is incentivized, has, has the right level of influence, and is, uh, is accorded a, a certain level of reputation based on the kinds of actions that they've taken in the past. Because it is a combination of reputation, the rights that you accord on the basis of that, the influence that that yields, all of which work together to determine the impact that every single person's participation will have on the platform. So a very important part of platform design is designing this, these various rules of governance. What are the actions that people take? How does that feedback into the reputation of, the, of uh, the various participants? And how does that uh, lead to the outcomes that the platform delivers? We talked about reputation systems. And along with that, we have learning filters, which where the platform, the more the platform learns about users, the more it starts filtering what is relevant to the user. And as the platform scales, the platform itself learns and is able to orchestrate the ecosystem better. At the same time, the ecosystem also learns how to use the platform much better. And all of these things work together to start scaling the platform as the platform uh, matures, as users' journeys on the platform mature. So it's a combination of these various factors. When we're building a platform, we need to think about what are the factors that are uh, impacting network effects. How are we thinking about ecosystem governance? How, how are we thinking about creating a reputation system? And what are the ways in which uh, an individual's reputation changes the access or influence that the individual has in the ecosystem? It's a combination of all of these different elements that together work to create scale on the platform. A common framework that I, uh, I like to use when I think of different platforms is the idea of the platform stack. And I find this framework helpful because when we talk about platforms, we, we talk about a lot of different things as platforms. We talk about uh, Apple and Android as platforms, Microsoft Windows as platforms, but then we talk about Snapchat uh, as platforms as well. We talk about Alibaba as a platform as well. So there's a whole spectrum of, um, uh, of examples across industries. And if you really look at it, every in, uh, the, the platform business model is so horizontal that you can see different manifestations of it in every different industry. And so uh, a framework that I use to wrap my head or help uh, who are, who are trying to understand this, wrap their heads around this, is the idea of the platform stack, which is that every platform fundamentally has three layers of value. There is the infrastructure, which we understand really well, because that is the most visible part of the platform. That is the technology, that is uh, the set of processes, whether te uh, technological or human processes that work together to support users. So that's the infrastructure. There's the network or the ecosystem that coalesces around the platform and interact with each other. And then there's the data layer. And now when we think of it in these three layers, it helps us to understand what is a platform, what is not a platform, and what is, this, what is the relative strength of one platform model versus another. Let's take a few examples. If you think of Instagram, before Instagram uh, got big as this uh, app, app where you could take a picture and put a really cool filter on top of it, you have Hipstamatic, which was out there on the App Store, where you, can, you could again take a picture, put a filter on top of it, and make a, a really cool picture. The, the key difference between Instagram and Hipstamatic was the fact that once you'd taken a picture, once you'd put a filter, the next thing that you did on Instagram was it asked you to share, share the picture on Facebook. And because of that, Instagram was building an implicit network at the back end to the extent that Facebook never realized that there was a competitor coming up until they had reached that level of scale. And so the single uh, thing that was different, it, from a feature perspective, it was just an extra share button that was part of the creation workflow. But from a platform perspective, it moved Instagram from being just infrastructure to becoming a network around that infrastructure, which was constantly providing a lot of data into what people liked, what people did not like. And that's how Instagram ended up creating a platform across all three layers. We've seen this in different cases as well. If you think of um, personal finance, we used to use Quicken, which was largely just software. But if you look at Mint, Mint provided the software for free and then used that to acquire data about users. And it used that data to match users with financial institutions who wanted to sell them financial products. And that's how Mint created an end-to-end -end platform. Another example is um, if you think of Monster and LinkedIn. Fundamentally, 
from a recruitment perspective, they, they try to solve the same problem, but the approach to it has been very different. Monster started by creating a job board, so it created a network, but it did not really have a lot of data. LinkedIn started by creating a professional network, which allowed it to keep absorbing data. And even if you look at the kinds of features LinkedIn built, uh, the profile completeness progress bar, they were all examples of a company that wanted to absorb data. And it was that absorption of data that led to a much larger network being created because LinkedIn could then start determining what jobs were relevant to passive job seekers, job seekers who would not otherwise have gone and put their um, uh, applications on Monster, but who could be served uh, job opportunities over here. Another example of how different platforms uh, play out is, is uh, the idea of Flickr versus Facebook photos. For the long time, Flickr was the place where people used to, used to store all their photos online, and today that's become Facebook. If you take a picture, you end up storing that picture on Facebook. And the reason for that is that Facebook has a much more vibrant network layer. And photos no longer, uh, it's no longer about an infrastructure to, show, uh, to, to store photos. It's about a network where conversations can be encouraged around these pictures. And so there's been a, a shift in terms of where, fo where people uh, uh, store photos today. And, and likewise, as a final example, MySpace and Facebook, um, we're, we're both social networks, and very often we, we, uh, uh, you know, we dismiss it by saying Facebook was a much better product, and that, that was all there, there was to it. But if you look at it, MySpace and Facebook, uh, the difference between the two is, is really vast in the sense that the one thing that drove Facebook to become so successful was the idea of data, and using that data to create a personalized feed that changed uh, an active intent of, I want to talk to a friend, to a passive intent of, I just want to figure out what's happening in my network. People used to go to MySpace once in three days when they wanted to talk to somebody. People go to Facebook 30 times a day because they just want to figure out what's happening, wh where, where are people going on vacation, and what, what did people have for breakfast, and all of that starts coming up on the feed. And, and that's been the fundamental sh difference between MySpace and Facebook. And if you think of Facebook, everything they've done from Facebook Connect uh, to all the other integrations that they've built, all of which show that before they think of themselves at the network layer, they also complement that thinking of themselves at the data layer. So thinking of platforms, no matter what you're building, in terms of the platform stack helps in understanding whether you're executing across all these three layers, whether you're creating value in tandem at the network layer, at the data layer, uh, and, and scaling value in that fashion. I want to spend the last few minutes talking about uh, a few ways people think about platforms. And I think of these as platform narratives. And because when people think about platforms, there are certain misconceptions or certain immediate uh, reactions that come to mind. The first is something that I talked about in the beginning, which is the idea of digital versus digitized. When we think about digital, very often we end up with the channel fallacy. We, we, when somebody says, we want to take you digital, we say, you know what, this is too complex, we want to do it offline, we don't want digital. The moment we said offline versus digital, we've already gotten into a channel fallacy. Instead, what really matters is not digital, but digitized. What can be digitized and made more efficient? Let's take a few examples where we repeatedly see that in a market, when the critical source of value, the critical decision factor that drives demand gets digitized, the market can be reorganized towards much more efficient value exchange. Let's take a few examples. If you think of the time uh, when Amazon and Netflix came over, uh, the first thing that uh, the, the, the reason that Amazon and Netflix were so successful was that they were the first instances of digitization of buyer behavior. Before that, we had retail. We used to go to a store. So our local uh, mom and pop shop would probably know what kind of things we liked, and when we went there, they would automatically rec recommend that, but that would not scale. Buyer behavior was logged in all these individual minds. What happened with Amazon was buyer behavior was digitized for the first time, Amazon was able to use it to create more value to so collaborative filtering and other mechanisms on top of this digitized buyer behavior. And because buyer behavior was digitized, they could move buyers towards entirely new interactions, even interactions they would not have originated organically in the minds of the buyer. So that was an example where the, the shift that happened was not in terms of physical and digital alone, it was the idea of digitization. If you look at Airbnb, Airbnb Came, uh, a a Airbnb became a, a, a sustainable business model in this particular era because at this point in time, we had successfully digitized trust. 
Back in 2003, 2004, before Facebook enforced uh, real-world identity on the internet, people on the internet were, used the internet anonymously. And so it was very difficult to have a real-world transaction like the kind that Airbnb allows, where there, there are real risks involved. It was really difficult to facilitate that kind of transaction over an anonymized internet. Because of Facebook and because of other social technologies, identity and trust got digitized. So that by the time that Airbnb came out there, there was a way, there was a mechanism by which you could determine uh, whether somebody was trustworthy or not to a certain extent. And that is where this whole idea of the sharing economy, um, whether it's a misnomer or not, but the whole idea of the sharing economy came up because of the, of the fact that the fundamental element of identity and trust had been digitized. Another thing that happened over the last seven to eight years was the rise of the smartphone. So just as the rise of the social web led to um, an idea like Airbnb getting executed, the rise of the smartphone allowed for the first time a car's location and a rider's location to be digitized. And because car, a car's location could be digitized, it could now be orchestrated on a new market, and that is how Uber came into being. So if you look at all of these platforms, what you repeatedly see is that it's... Uh, is that none of them subscribe to the channel fallacy of we're moving something from offline to online. In all these cases, what's happening is we're moving an unintelligent, non-digitized market to an intelligent, digitized market. Take another example. We have freelancer marketplaces today. The reason free freelancer marketplaces exist is because we have been able to digitize the reputation of freelancers. And that allows a client to work with a freelancer across the world. And with the rise of the industrial internet, we're seeing uh, companies like GE, company, companies like Bosch getting into platforms, Airbus, all of these companies getting into building platforms because machine performance is getting digitized with the Internet of Things. So when we look at platforms, we need to, what, what we should be looking at is not what kind of channels are being used. Is an offline behavior being replaced with online? It's not all of these aspects. It's about looking at the market that the platform is enabling and asking ourselves, what does supply mean in this market? How do people take decisions in this market? Which of these two things could we digitize? Could we, could we digitize both of these things? Could we then make more efficient interactions ensue because of this digitization? That's what a platform fundamentally allows. And so the first narrative that I wanted to share was about the distinction between digital versus digitized. A second narrative that surrounds platforms and, and leads to uh, knee-jerk reactions is the narrative of disintermediation versus amplification. There's this whole, um, uh, the gospel of disruption that repeatedly likes to use the word disintermediation, that the internet is disintermediating everything. Now that, that has happened in certain cases. I gave the example of uh, publishing uh, some time back. There have been cases where publishers have been disintermediated and Amazon has allowed authors to connect directly um, with, with, with readers. Uh, in a similar way, Facebook uh, disintermediates uh, content out of media companies so that journalists can now uh, create followings directly with their followers. Uh, and Apple's uh, disintermediated the relationship that developers could have with users. So there have been cases where disintermediation has played out. But a critical element that allows disintermediation to play out is when the intermediary is powerful only because the intermediary holds information. As a result, when that information gets digitized and gets put up on an open platform, the intermediary's power goes down. However, if you look at intermediaries that do not merely hold information but also provide valuable services, platforms do not disintermediate them, they actually amplify them. A classic example of that is real estate. If you look at real estate, the platforms actually amplify the brokers because brokers do not pro simply provide information services, they also provide all the adjacent attendant services that enables a buyer to go through this whole journey of buying a house. And so when a platform comes in and aggregates that inventory, what it does is it removes the power differences between brokers and allows somebody without the same uh, network, uh, without the same level of experience, to come and get access to, an in, uh, to this new inventory and then start competing at the same level. So what platforms do in, in markets where intermediaries provide information but also services is that they amplify the ability of the intermediary to provide better services. Another narrative that we see repeatedly is the difference between, uh, is, is the difference between discovery and an exchange and, or, or relationship. And, and let me um, share what I mean by that. When we think about platforms, we often think about the idea of discovery. 
which is that platforms help two sides to discover each other. And these are examples of all those kinds of platforms. Mash.com, eBay, Airbnb, platforms that enable two sides to discover each other. Then there are platforms that not only enable these two sides to discover each other, they also enable them to ex have a successful exchange. So if you think of Uber, uh, it helped me find um, somebody to uh, connect with. Uh, it, it, helps, it helps you connect me with the driver, but it also manages and uh, tracks the exchange that happens through the system. And if you think of Facebook, LinkedIn, these are platforms that do not just help with discovery and exchange, they also help with relationship. So when we're building a platform, we need to ask ourselves, which of these components does our platform have? Is it only about discovery? Is it about relationships? Is it about exchange? Depending on which of these components our platform has, the kinds of features that we end up building within that platform can completely change. The final two narr narratives that I want to talk about, one is the idea of transactions versus journeys. When we think of platforms, very often we get caught up with transactions because a lot of platforms that we see out there today enable very transactional exchanges. I go onto eBay, I buy something, the transaction is done, I go out of it. But when we talk about something like Glue, we're really talking about complex journeys. Growth is not a transaction. You can't just throw some value, get some feedback, and you grow out of it. You grow through a journey. And so when, when we take these two narratives, the tra transaction versus uh, journey and the narrative of uh, discovery, exchange, and relationship, and if we plot it in this way, it, it's, it shows very interestingly where different platforms fall in. So, for example, a lot of platforms that we're familiar with, eBay, Airbnb, they are transaction discovery platforms. They help you discover somebody you transact with, enable the transaction, and they're done. There are examples like Uber, Upwork, which help you um, discover, but also help you manage a relationship or an exchange. Uh, I would even put Facebook in this category because fundamentally Facebook is about social transactions. I participate on Facebook only because whenever I, I write something or I, uh, I put up a picture, I get paid in terms of likes and comments. And so fundamentally, Facebook is a, is a transactional platform. On the other end, you have platforms that lead to journeys. So dating platforms, for example, help you discover new journeys. Hopefully they are not transactions, they're journeys, right? <laughs> and depends on how you use it, but, but, but they're, 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 they're built with the intent of enabling journeys. And so when, when you look at Glue, Glue sort of uh, fits into this whole other category of relationship and exchange with journeys. And the reason I share this, the reason I share these narratives is because very often we look at something and say, that didn't work for Airbnb, that's not going to work for us. And when we try to try to use those mental models, let's ask ourselves exactly what element of the platform we're talking about, whether the narrative that works for, uh, whether, whether the narrative that applies on this uh, anchor pla platform also applies to us, and then try to take it in, in, in this direction. And that's the reason for sharing uh, some of these narratives. The final narrative that I want to talk about is that platforms create value in three different uh, phases. Very often, some people uh, criticize platforms uh, where they say that platforms are not creating new value, they're just reorganizing existing value. Well, platforms create value in three different phases. The first is at the, at the level of the interaction. They make the interaction more efficient. They make the individual interaction more efficient. They can make the individual growth journey more efficient, for example. The second level of value creation is across interactions, where Across the system, multiple interactions are happening, and so you start seeing economies of scale and scope once the platform comes in. But the real value of the platform comes in when the platform learns enough about the market to start moving the market in entirely new directions, entirely new interactions, and that's where the power of externalities comes in. And so every platform goes through these three phases where it creates value at the level of efficiency, at the level of economies, at the level of externalities. And again, when we look at a platform, we need to ask ourselves, which of these phases are we, are we operating in, and accordingly, what kinds of mechanics apply to us? So the reason for sharing uh, these narratives was that when we think about uh, a new platform, when we, when we think about something that hasn't traditionally been digitized, how do we, how do we wrap our heads around that? How do we uh, uh, determine whether um, transition to s that kind of a platform interaction will actually work? These are certain narratives that help us understand whether such a transition would work in a new platform or not. So to, uh, finally, um, the key message, as I uh, mentioned in the beginning, is that the power of platforms is fundamentally about two things. It's about creating access and enabling amplification. Platforms are interactions enabled by infrastructure. Access leads to interactions. Infrastructure enable amplification. 
And that's what the power of the platforms is all about. Thank you so much for listening. I'm happy to discuss more on the sidelines uh, on the idea of platforms. Thank you.